Jesus and the Miraculous Catch of Fish. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fine fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to him, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Jesus reinstates Peter. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Thanks, Libby. Appreciate that. Hi, my name is uh, Lloyd Biddle. I'm one of the associate pastors here at High Point Church. Um, if you were here last week, you heard that Pastor Nick is going to go on sabbatical for the next eight or nine weeks. So today you've got a dynamic speaker to be followed up by more after that. So, um, we have Dr. Jared Alcantara with us this morning. He is a professor at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He is a homiletics or preaching professor there. Um, he's been there since 2014. Uh, he, uh, we have a few things in common. One, both of us uh, graduated from, from Wheaton. His undergraduate degree is in ancient languages there. From there, he went on to get an MDiv at Gordon-Conwell um, in Boston. And then he went to uh, University of Edinburgh to get a master's in theology there. And uh, then he spent uh, five years at Princeton Theological uh, Seminary uh, working on his, um, his PhD. And his dissertation uh, has been turned into a book that's actually on my bookshelves, so I highly commend it to you. It's called Crossover Preaching, Intercultural Improv Improvisational Homiletics in Conversation with Gardner C. Taylor. This was re released in October 2015. Uh, not only have, did I read uh, that book and another that he's written, I've also been reading a lot of the sermons from, from Gardner Taylor as well. Um, and then I've been following him. So the first uh, interaction with him was actually around the time he got to Trinity. Uh, Pastor Nick called him in. We had a Skype meeting to talk about our, our philosophies and strategies and theology around multiculturalism. So he gave us a couple of hours and, and we, we talked. And since then, I've just kind of been following him. And so this summer he was at uh, chapel 
at Wheaton, and I, I caught a sermon of his there. I've, a couple of his uh, Ted's uh, university chapels, so I kind of feel like I know a lot about him just through his preaching. Um, Jared is passionate about equipping students to preach God's word in ways that are faithful, effective, clear, creative, and inspiring. His research interests are, are various. Global South preaching, homiletical theory, preaching and new media, a social location, and the role of race and, and ethnicity in preaching, especially in Latino and African American context. He lives in the Chicagoland area, in fact, not far from my mother-in-law, um, and uh, his wife Jennifer and three daughters are here with us. I didn't, I didn't scan around and meet them, but I'm gonna meet them after the service today. Um, he plays piano, enjoys disc golf, and he's a rabid Philadelphia Eagles fan. I don't take that against, don't count that against him that he's not a Bears fan. I know how many great Bears fans there are here. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, won't you welcome him this morning as he comes to preach the word, Dr. Jared Alcantara. Come on. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. Thank you so much uh, for that kind and gracious introduction from Pastor Lloyd and to Pastor Nick and to everyone here at High Point, I just want to thank you and give thanks to God for your hospitality, for your warmth. Uh, some of you may have seen my wife, uh, Jennifer. She was getting kids to Sunday school, kids who stayed up way too late at the hotel last night. Some of you may know what that's like, but uh, thank you, and uh, let's start by uh, going to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks, and we praise you, for it was not our alarm clocks that woke us up this morning. You are the God who allows air to enter our lungs, the God who brought us here. Were it not for Jesus, where would we be? Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the privilege that's ours to look at your word together. As we gather around your word, would you help us to have eyes to see ears to hear, hearts that are tender, so that we might see what you want us to see and hear what you're calling us to hear, that our hearts would be open, so that we might leave this place changed, so that we might be more conformable to the image and likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ, for we pray these things in his name, amen. Well, we're in John chapter 21, so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them. That's where we are, John 21, verses 1 through 19. And while you're turning there, I wanted to take you back in time to when I was eight years old. Some of you are saying, he looks pretty young. That probably wasn't that long ago, uh, but it was a little while ago. And I was playing Little League Baseball. Anyone ever play Little League Baseball when you were a kid? Or maybe your kids play it now or they used to. Well, I played Little League Baseball and I played for a team called Post 76, the yellow team. And we played against the blue team. I don't remember the name of the blue team. It's been a while now. But I want to take you to the bottom of the sixth inning, which in Little League terms is the bottom of the ninth inning. So the last inning in the game. And we were playing the field. I was playing first base. We had our best pitcher on the mound, Richard Wright. Uh, the blue team had the bases loaded, two outs, bottom of the sixth. The game-winning run is coming to the plate. We're leading four games to one, which to only give up one run in Little League is quite an accomplishment. Uh, but we had our best pitcher on the mound, Richard. I was playing first base, and Chris Butts came to the plate. And Chris Butts was a great hitter, so everyone was a bit nervous. But we were one out away, and Richard was pitching. So I felt good about our chances. Richard... Pitched the ball over the plate, and I heard contact with the bat, and it looked like it was going to second base, but the no-talent teenage umpire was in my way. So I thought it went to second. I looked over to the second baseman to have him throw it to me. I've got my glove open. I've got a slight grin on my face because we're about to win the game, and perhaps you know where this is headed. Richard actually cut off the ball at the pitcher's mound, but I didn't see him. And all of a sudden, I heard him shouting my name, but by then it was too late. In retrospect, I wish it would have hit me in the face. It didn't. It sailed over my head about 20, 25 feet behind first base. And if you've ever been to a little league, 
infield. It's not very large, and so it doesn't take long to get around the bases. So I run to the ball, and everyone's shouting, throw it home, throw it home. That's my only play, because the ball went so far behind me. And I got that ball, and I threw it as hard and as fast and as far as I could to the catcher, and it was straight, but it was high. So high that it went over the backstop and into the woods behind (laughs) the field. And that was it. Game over. Five to four. And now every time I go by a little league field, I start to cry. No, I'm just kidding. I'm (laughs) I'm fine. Everything's fine. I'm I'm better now. Uh, But at the time, at the time, I just remember feeling so much shame and disappointment. I had let myself down, I had let my team down, I let my dad down. My dad was the coach of the team. And I just remember I cried all the way home. Now perhaps you can relate. Now you may not relate to the circumstances, but you relate to the emotions, that feeling like you've let yourself down, like you've let other people down, like you've let God down. And the circumstances might be different, but the emotions are the same. Because you know that there's a painful gap between the way things are supposed to be and the way things are. Between the expectations others have for you and your inability to meet them. Between the person that you're supposed to be and the person that you are. It's a painful gap. Sometimes we're haunted by it. I want you to know that there's someone who can relate. Uh, During one of his most courageous moments, or at least he thought it was one of his courageous moments at the time, uh, his teacher had said to him, where I'm going, you cannot follow. And you know what he said? He said, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And things got worse from there. At a moment his Lord's loneliest moment before the cross, he fell asleep. And as his Lord stood before the Sanhedrin under the cover of night, he denied him not once, not twice, but three times. By the time we get to this story, Jesus has already been resurrected. He's risen again, and he's appeared to Mary Magdalene, and appeared to the disciples, and appeared to Thomas, and it's clear that Jesus has been victorious over death and the devil and destruction, but you have to see that John, this great literary writer of the Gospel of John, is bringing to resolution this dynamic between Jesus and Peter. For Peter, in a sense, must come to the end of himself and confront his shame and disappointment in order to start again with God. You see, Jesus wants to restore and recommission Peter, just as he wants to restore and recommission us. But that's where the story ends. That's not where it begins. It begins in the context of shame and disappointment. It begins with the lack of resolution, or we might say irresolution, when it comes to Peter's relationship to Jesus. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to engage this text with a series of questions that I think get at what happens with the disciples and what happens in Peter's life. And I think these questions would be relevant to us as well. So let me start with the first question. Will you recognize who Jesus is? Jesus' followers must come to the realization that Jesus, who is the Lord, walks among them and is with them. Let's begin where the story begins. So look back at verses 1 through 2. Seven of Jesus' remaining 11 disciples are up at the Sea of Galilee. And Peter, who's the leader of the band, says, I'm going out to fish. That's verse 3. And the other disciples, many of whom were trained fishermen, say, we'll we'll go out with you. 
Now, some commentators, some preachers like to say that Peter and the disciples were somehow abandoning their mission or giving up on the cause, but there aren't really any hints or clues in the text that would lead us to that conclusion. Here's what a commentator named George Beasley Murray writes. There's, a, there's not a hint of aimlessness or desperation in the text. Even though Jesus be crucified and risen from the dead, the disciples must still eat. <laughs> Some people think that they were actually catching fish in order to sell the fish so that they'd be able to live on something. That's why there's a count, 153, so that they'll know how to divide the proceeds. Uh, they go out at night, as many fishermen do, especially in the Middle East where it's very hot. Going out at night would be much easier on the body. Also, a lot of fishermen go out at night in order to bring the catch of fish to the morning market. Now, that's fresh fish. But according to the text, if you look at the end of verse 3, when they went out and got into the boat, that night they caught what? Nothing. Nothing. Bunch of trained fishermen caught nothing. Isn't it curious? Have you ever realized this? That throughout the Gospels, the only time the disciples catch fish is when Jesus is with them. Jesus is a trained carpenter, yet they can't catch any fish unless Jesus is there. Jesus isn't with them on the boat. They caught nothing. Apart from Jesus... They're out of luck. It's interesting. When Jesus was telling about the vine and the branches, you know what he said in John 15? He said, I am the true vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I remember hearing a story about, uh, by Pete Briscoe. Some of you have heard that name. He's the son of the well-known preachers and evangelists, Jill and Stuart Briscoe. And when Pete was a little boy, his parents were studying at Bible College in England. It's called Cape and Reed. And he tells a story about when he was young, he was at church, he was in Sunday school, and their Sunday school teacher liked to do magic tricks. It was a way to engage the kids in the Bible lesson for the day. So one day, the Sunday school teacher brought a glove in, and, and he laid the glove on the table, and he asked the kids, who wants to see me make this glove levitate. And they said, we do, we do. And he said, who wants to see me make this glove levitate? And they said, we do, we do. And he said, okay. He took his magic wand and he said, ready? Glove, levitate. And this little British boy next to Pete Briscoe said, do you think we're stupid? <laughs> Your hand is in the glove. And then the teacher quoted from Galatians 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then he said to the children, it's not the glove. It's the hand in the glove that gives it power. So you see, you want to grow this church, and you want to see people who are lost come to saving faith. You want to see followers of Jesus Christ go deeper and wider in their faith with him. But I want you to know something. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. You want your family to flourish, and you want your kids to grow up and love God. But I want you to know something. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. You want to be a light in your workplace, salt of the earth at your school, but I want you to know something. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. That night, a bunch of trained fishermen that were apart from Jesus caught nothing. So we pick up the story in verse 4. Early in the morning, Jesus is standing on the shore. We read in verse 8 that he's about 100 yards away from them. That's the, a full-length football field away from them. So he's not too close to them. It's hard to recognize someone standing at 100 yards away. I would imagine there might have been some fog that the sun was not fully up. And he calls to them from the shore, Haven't you any fish? 
Now, in the original, it's actually a little bit more extreme. It's something like, don't you have any fish? Or you don't have any fish, do you? Uh, imagine at the end of your workday, if you work in an office, your boss comes into the room and says, so you haven't gotten any work done, have you? <laughs> or you're a stay-at-home mom or dad, and your kids get home from school, and they say, so you haven't been doing much around the house, have you? There's a little bit of a sting to it. You don't have any fish, do you? No, they say to the stranger. And I love this part. Throw your net on the other side of the boat. Now, I'm from New Jersey, which means that I've got a little bit of an edge to me. Sometimes I can be rude. And uh, I just imagine being in the boat there, and this stranger says, Hey, try the right side of the boat. And I'm thinking to myself, Oh, okay, who is this guy? Oh, maybe we should try both sides of the boat in order to catch the fish. Thomas is in the boat saying, I doubt if that'll make a difference. <laughs> but they do it. They throw their net on the right side of the boat. And you know what happens. It says in verse 6, when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. It's interesting. There's a story in Luke chapter 5. Peter's out on a boat and they can't catch any fish and someone calls to them from the shore. It's Jesus. He says, throw your net on the side of the boat and try one more time. There's a miraculous catch of fish there too. But what happens is this recognition in verse 7. The disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John's nickname, John the writer of this gospel, says, it is the Lord. And there's a continuation of the theme. When Mary Magdalene saw Jesus, she went back to the disciples in 20 verse 18 and says, she said, I have seen the Lord. In 20 verse 20, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Thomas says in chapter 20, verse 28, my Lord and my God. John, in this verse, says it is the Lord. And you know what Peter does? I love what Peter does. It's just his personality. He acts before he thinks. He grabs his outer garment, and it says in the text at the end of verse 8, he jumped into the water. It's literally, he cast himself into the water, Jacques Cousteau style. He makes a beeline to Jesus. And so we come back to that question. Do you recognize who Jesus is? It is the Lord, they say. They didn't realize it was him at first, but it was he who was calling them from the shore. And if I might use my sanctified imagination for a moment, I wonder if Jesus is also calling to you from the shore. And he might not, or you might not like what he has to say. Nevertheless, he calls you. And he says, I want to be the Lord over your life. I want to be the Lord over your marriage and over your family and over your singleness. I want to be the Lord over the, your addiction with which you struggle. I want to be the Lord over your depression. I want to be your Lord. The question isn't whether he's calling to us. The question is whether we're listening. There are so many voices vying for my affection and your affection and allegiance that it's easy to stop listening to the voice of Jesus, to stop remembering just who it is who calls us. It is the Lord, they say. They recognize him as Lord and that it's he who calls them. Jesus also calls to the unbeliever and says, I am the truth that you are longing for. I am the meaning and significance that you are searching for. I am the home that you are hoping for. I am the Savior who covers over even your sin. He calls to you too if you would but come to him. Repent of your sins. Trust him by faith. Confess him as Lord. Do you recognize who Jesus is? That's the first question. Second question is, will you let Jesus restore you? Will you let Jesus 
restore you. Uh, to restore something is to bring it back to its original condition of beauty. It falls into disrepair and to bring it back so that it's something beautiful again. So people restore paintings, they restore sculptures, they restore buildings so that people can benefit from something beautiful restored to its original condition. Jesus restores Peter on the banks of the Sea of Galilee, and I would argue that he can also restore you and me. But before we get to Jesus' conversation with Peter, I want to pick it up at verse 9. The other people in the boat whom Peter had abandoned when he made his way to Jesus, the other people in the boat arrived in verse 9. They saw a fire of burning coals, or some of you may have charcoal fire, and there was fish on it and some bread. Now, the text doesn't say whether Jesus bought the fish or caught the fish, but I kind of like to think that he caught the fish. So you've got all these disciples out there all night. They can't catch anything. Jesus throws the net into the water. And by the time they get there, he's cooking breakfast. So the fish is out on the fire. There's some bread. But there's not enough fish for everyone. I mean, he could have multiplied the bread and fish if he wanted to. But he said, why don't you bring some fish over? That's verse 10. So Simon Peter comes, and they drag the net ashore. And then he says, come and have breakfast with me. It's an invitation to communion, in a sense. Now, it says that they were terrified. Uh, There was a reverential awe, a holy fear. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. So I'm wondering if the small talk was a little bit awkward there, as the risen Lord is sitting around the fire, and they're eating breakfast together. I mean, what do you say? Do you you say, So, you were crucified, dead, buried, rose again. Talk to us a little bit about what that was like. Um, So, you went through a locked door in Jerusalem, and now you're in Galilee. Tell me a little bit more about divine transportation and how that works. No one dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was Jesus. It's interesting. Jesus has risen from the dead, been victorious over death, emptied the grave, defeated sin. But even now, it says in verse 13, he took the bread, he gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. It's easy to miss that little detail. The risen Savior, the victorious Lord, even now, is serving them, isn't he? He says, come and have breakfast with me, and it says he gave him the fish, and he gave them the bread. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, verse 45. Even here, Jesus is serving. But then it comes time to have a conversation with Peter. It's time to talk with Peter for a little while and to ask him some hard questions. Sometimes that's what the Lord needs to do in your life and mine, is ask us some hard questions about where our affections and our allegiances lie. But Jesus does have a restoration plan for Peter. Some of you have that subheading, the reinstatement of Peter. He has a plan to move him from shame and disappointment to restoration and reconciliation and recommission. So he asks him, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? That's verse 15. Now, commentators like to split hairs over what the these are in this text. Is Jesus saying to Peter, do you love me more than these other disciples love me, the ones who are around? He was probably talking to Peter in some sort of public way. It's not a completely private conversation. Do you love me more than they love me? In other words, is your love for me greater than their love for me? That's one possibility. Or, Peter, do you love me more than you love these disciples? In other words, do you love me most as compared to your love for them, these brothers in arms? 
Some commentators, well-respected commentators, think that Jesus might be asking them, do you love me more than the fish and the boats and the equipment? Do you love me more than your former vocation? Do you love me more than these things? I like to think that it's all of that and more. The real question is whether Peter's love for Jesus is greater than any other love that he has. That's the question that he has for him and the question that he has for you and for me. Do you love me more than these? Fill in the blank. Peter responds and says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, it seems at first glance that there's some distance and detachment here if uh, my wife asks me, do you love me? And I say, you know that I love you. That's not the same thing as saying I love you. But it's not exactly what's going on here. There's a pattern that's emerging. So Peter says, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my lambs. And he asks again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he says, take care of my sheep. And the third time he says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And the text says that Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time. Now, why would Peter be so hurt at a moment like this? Some commentators and theologians and preachers like to point out that in the original Greek, there's two different verbs for love. There's phileo love and agapao love. And Jesus says, do you love me with an agapao love? And Peter says, no, I love you with, an, with a phileo love. And they try to make the claim that it's a lesser form of love. That Peter says, I, I love you in, in a brotherly kind of love, not in an all-consuming, jealous love. But there's some problems with that logic. First of all, uh, Jesus and Peter spoke Aramaic, not Greek. Second of all, uh, the word phileo love is used to describe the love that God the Father has for God the Son in John 5, verse 20, so it can't be a lesser form of love. No, Peter is hurt because Jesus has to ask him a third time where his true affections lie. And there's something significant going on in the text. There's a charcoal fire, a fire of burning coals. You know that word only occurs one other time in the whole New Testament? It occurs in John 18, verse 18. You don't need to turn there. It says, It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm, and Peter was with them. Here's what commentator Gerald Borshert writes. The third time did it. Imagine again the scene as the evangelist framed it a charcoal fire, and three questions about Peter's relationship to Jesus. It hardly takes a genius to relate this event to that of the denial. Facing up to oneself is a traumatic experience. That last line really struck me. Facing up to oneself is a traumatic experience. We have to tell the truth to ourselves about ourselves in order to create space to receive the seed of the gospel and for it to go down deep in our hearts and soul. I remember a couple of years ago when we moved to Illinois. It was our first summer, full summer in Illinois, and we still didn't really know a lot of people. And so we took our kids to a vacation Bible school at a local church in our town, a little Lutheran church. Our two older kids went. Our, our younger daughter was two at the time, and she was too young to go. But the two older girls went Monday through Friday, 9 to noon, and they had a wonderful time. And as churches often do, they invite the parents to come to the big VBS Sunday after that Friday. And so we visited this church, we, which we had never been to before, and we found out that they didn't have any child care or Sunday school. So uh, we had our two-year-old with us in the back of the sanctuary. Some of you who've had young kids, you know, sometimes you head toward the back just in case things don't go well. Uh, so we were with our two-year-old in the back, and they gave her a coloring book and crayons and everything. And they invited the older kids up front, the VBS kids. So our two older kids went up front, and they sang the VBS songs, and they were so happy. They had a great time, and the pastor got up front and had the handheld mic and started dialoguing with the kids. And the pastor said, kids, you remember on Monday we talked about provision. Who did God provide for and the kids said, Elijah. And then the pastor said, on Tuesday, we talked about 
healing. Who did God heal? And the kid said, Naaman the Syrian, which I found pretty impressive because that's not a well-known story in the Old Testament. But they said, Naaman the Syrian. And then the pastor said, on Wednesday, we talked about forgiveness and our sin. And we talked about what it's like to deny and to betray Jesus. Who was it that betrayed Jesus? And out of nowhere, our two-year-old says, me! The 30 kids up front couldn't even get a word out before our two-year-old. And we're running and hushing her, and everyone's laughing around us. And we also would have accepted Judas or Peter for an answer. And I turn to my wife, and I say, theologically accurate, contextually inappropriate. (laughs) But you know... you know, you know where this is headed. She was right, wasn't she? Some of you grew up singing these songs in church. My Lord, what you did suffer was all for sinner's gain. Mine, mine was the transgression and thine the deadly pain. Or you sang, not my mother, not my father, not my sister, not my brother, but it's me, O oh Lord. It's me. Standing in the need of prayer. It's me. Peter must come to the end of himself in order to create space for a fresh hearing of the gospel. And that's what we must do as well. Peter discovers what you and I can discover for the first time or what we need to hear again, that God is a God of second chances. Anybody in here glad that God's a God of second chances? Yeah, me too. Me too. So the pattern emerges. You know that I love you. You know that I love you. And then at the end, or the, toward the end of verse 17, Lord, you know all things. It's a confession right there. You know all things. You know that I love you. Because you know my past shame and disappointment. You know my sin. And you know my self-loathing. And you know all of that. And you know that nevertheless, nevertheless, I love you because you love me. Just as Peter denied Jesus three times, so Jesus restores Peter through three questions. Uh, To restore something is to bring it back to its original condition of beauty and wonder so that others might benefit. Jesus restores Peter. The question is, will you let him restore you? Let me ask you something. If Jesus' arms upon the cross were wide enough to welcome in this sinner who denied him three times, one of the Versions of the story says, with curses, he denied it. If Jesus' arms upon the cross are wide enough to welcome this wretched sinner, aren't they wide enough to welcome you? No matter what your past mistake is, no matter what your shame and disappointment are. The question is, will you let him restore you? So we have these questions. Will you recognize who Jesus is? Will you let him restore you? And then there's one final one. Will you let Jesus recommission you? At the beginning of this journey with the disciples, he commissions them. He says, I will make you fishers of men, fishers of people. And now, in a sense, he's recommissioning all of the disciples, and in particular, recommissioning Peter. And he's recommissioning him in a trajectory for a purpose. And it's this, just like with us. Jesus recommissions him to love, to serve, and to die. Jesus recommissions us to love him. So we come back to that question, do you love me more than these? So Jesus asks you, do you love me more than your workaholism? Do you love me more than your desire for recognition and approval? Do you love me depending on the degrees that are on your wall or the money that's in your bank account? Do you love me more than those things? 
Do you love me that much? Even your blood kin, do you love me more than these? Not all of those things are bad. It's when they get misplaced that they can become bad. Jesus doesn't want to be one of our priorities among many priorities. He wants to be our one priority and have everything else be an activity. To be recommissioned by Jesus is to say to him again, I I love you more than these. Maybe today at some point you need to get on your knees before the Lord and say, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to say, Lord, I know that I've disappointed you. I know about my own shame and my own stuff, but I bring it before you again and I say, I love you. I love you. I love you because you love me. Jesus also recommissions us to serve him. Look at the language of Jesus' responses. It starts in verse 15. Feed my lambs. Verse 16, take care of my sheep. At the end of verse 17, feed my sheep. Now it's important to remember that Jesus says that they're his sheep, they're not our sheep. Uh, Jesus didn't say you will build my church, he said I will build my church. Uh, To entrust ourselves to Jesus is to be entrusted with the flock that he's entrusted us with and put into our hands to steward and to care for in a way that honors God. I don't know what that looks like for you. It'd be good to ask the question, who has God entrusted to my care, into my care? Maybe he's entrusted into your care children or grandchildren, and what it looks like to honor God and glorify God is to serve him through stewarding that privilege, that opportunity. Maybe you're a supervisor of employees, and what it looks like to honor and glorify Jesus Christ is to uh, serve that group of people in a way that honors him. Jesus went before us when he said that he was the good shepherd, and he wasn't like the hired hand in John 10 who would abandon the sheep and run away when things got hard. No. He was the kind of shepherd who would lay down his life for the sheep. Who has God entrusted to you? And what would it look like to serve him in that place, at that moment, with that community of people? To love him well by serving him through serving them. And then, Jesus also recommissions us to die. Do you notice what he says to Peter? Look at verse 18. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God, and then he said to him, follow me. Our Christianity should cost us something. If it costs us nothing, then maybe it's a form of pseudo-Christianity. Now, I'm not saying that everyone's life needs to look like the way that Peter's life ends. In fact, as John is following behind them, if you track with the story, Jesus says to Peter, I have a different plan for John that I have for you, and that's not of concern to you what I have for John. What's of concern to you is what I have for you. Henry Nouwen, who's a well-known writer and speaker, he's now deceased, he was speaking to a group of seminarians at their graduation, and this is what he said to them. To grow in the spirit of your Lord means to be led to the same powerless place where he was led, Calvary upon the cross. Your life is not going to be easy, and it should not be easy. It ought to be radical and restless. It ought to lead to places you would rather not go. But you will find that precisely when you find yourself being girded and led to places you would rather not go, that the Spirit of God is with you. So we say to God, all that I am, all that I have, all that I hope to be, I give to you. We say, I'll do what you call me to do, and I'll go where you call me to go. But what if it's to a place you'd rather not go? To be recommissioned by Jesus 
is to say, I'll go with you anywhere. Because there's a truth about this restoration project. And it's quite simple. Jesus restores us for a purpose. To send us out to serve. That means to serve him by loving him. That means to serve the people around us by serving and loving them. That means to serve and love the world for which he died. Jesus restored us for a purpose, to recommission us, to send us out to serve. I remember toward the end of spring break, which for our kids was the end of March, I had a chance to preach at a school called uh, Grove City. It's in western Pennsylvania. And we drove out there as a family, and as we were driving back, we needed a place to stop, and so we decided to stop at a museum in Cleveland, and the museum was called the Christmas Story House and Museum. Now, did anybody uh, grow up watching the Christmas Story, or you saw it as adults? It came out in 1983. It's on every Christmas time, on repeat, like every other channel uh, during the Christmas season. And a lot of it was filmed in Cleveland. It was filmed other places as well. But the house where some of the scenes were located, it's in Cleveland, Ohio, even though it says it's in Indiana. It's this little house in Ohio. Reminded uh, the one who uh, financed the film of the house that he grew up in. So they filmed portions of it there. Uh, But the film came out in 1983. The original owner had put it on loan. uh, And then... uh, the film concluded, and the house started to fall in disrepair. It was in a tough neighborhood. Uh, and then the owner sold it to another owner and sold it to another owner, and the story goes on and on. And eventually, it was taken over by a motorcycle gang. And so what they would do is they would take their Harley Davidsons, and they would repair them in the living room of the house. So you got grease stains, oil stains everywhere. They were chain smokers, and so you have sm- the smell of smoke and the paint and all over the house. And they decided it was time to sell the house. And so they put the house up on eBay. Did you know you can buy a house on eBay? $150,000. It was purchased by a San Diego entrepreneur named Brian Jones. Now, how did Brian Jones make his fortune? He made it through a business that he started called the Red Rider Leg Lamp Company. And for those of you who've seen the film, the major award that Ralphie's dad receives is a Red Rider leg lamp, and Brian Jones made a fortune off of that replica. So he decided the least he could do is to invest in this beautiful house that he didn't want to see fall into uh, disrepair. So he did. And when he got there, he hadn't even seen the house. Uh, When he got there, he noticed that this was going to be a long journey. Uh, It cost him an additional $240,000 to repair all of the problems with the house, an electrical person and a plumber and a yard person and a carpenter and just on and on and on the story goes. But you know why he did it? I think you know. He loved it too much to lose it. He didn't want to see it be destroyed. You and I know someone like that, don't we? In gospel songs, they say he's a doctor in the sick room and a lawyer in the courtroom. He's a heart fixer and a soul regulator. Some Christians like to say he's better to me than I've been to myself. You may know who I'm talking about. He's the Lord. He's the great restorer of our souls and of our lives. He's the great recommissioner. He's the one who sends us out question is, will we let him send us to places we'd rather not go? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this great promise that you are a God of second chances. You are the Lord, the great restorer, the great recommissioner that you are indeed the one who loves us too much to lose us. Thank you for the hope of the gospel. Pray that the seed of your word would go down deep so that we would hear again the truth that you're a God of second chances, God who loves us too much to lose us. 
a God who restores us for a purpose, to send us out to serve, to go where you want us to go, be your hands and feet in the world. As we continue in our worship, God, would you fill us with gratitude over what you've done for us in Jesus Christ? Would you remind us that we serve a risen Savior? And would you challenge us again to follow you? For we pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.